All right, so acid-base titrations here. Everybody knows and loves the, love these because you guys did these for your lab practical in uh, your Chem 1 AL course, right? So we did these titrations here. Just to remind everybody, you have this piece of glassware called a burette. All right, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna place some titrant, is what we call it, some sodium hydroxide in our burette. And then in our flask, we have some acid, right? Those burettes, there's those long, skinny pieces of glassware, and they have that stopcock at the bottom that you can open and close. So you can release some of that sodium hydroxide out of the burette and into your flask, right? And so that's what you did. You released your sodium hydroxide into your flask of acid. You put the base in with the acid. You had an acid-base reaction that occurred, right? And then you kept on adding and adding and adding until you got to this certain point where your flask turned pink and then you stopped, okay? That end point, that color change in our titration is what we call the equivalence point. What it means to be at the equivalence point is that the moles of acid in your flask that you started out with is now equal to the moles of base that you added. All right, so you added just enough base to react with all of that acid, and then you stopped, okay? And so in lab, you would have done calculations based on how much base you added, um, right, w using that data from that equivalence point. In this course, we're gonna take this same experiment and we're gonna do a little bit of a deeper dive on it. We're not just concerned with what happens at the equivalence point here. We have a different goal in mind. Our goal for these acid-base titrations is to be able to calculate the pH at any point during our titration. All right, so we're not just concerned with what happens at the equivalence point. We want to be able to calculate the pH at every single point in that titration. How does the pH change when one drop's added? How does it change when 20 drops are added? How does it change when you get to the equivalence point, et cetera, et cetera, right? So at each point along this titration, we want to ask ourselves what the, uh, what the pH is, okay? Um, these are going to, this topic's going to roll together in true course design fashion, going to roll together a bunch of stuff that we've done before, right? We're going to be talking about pH. We're also going to be talking about solutions, concentrations, and volumes, okay? So let's take a look at this pH curve for a strong acid and strong base, okay? So this is what happens to the pH at every point along this titration here. On my y-axis, I have the pH of my solution. And on the x-axis, I have the volume of that base that was added, right? So how much did I add from my burette? So at the very beginning here, we are starting with no base in our flask, right? Just that flask of acid. And then we're slowly titrating in that strong base, which is why my pH is going up, okay? Then I get to this certain point and it just kind of like skyrockets up to this very high pH value and then sort of just gets slowly more and more basic as I go, okay? What's up? Did you have a question? No, okay, cool. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this curve here. We're going to kind of pick it apart because depending on where we are in this pH curve, we're going to have a little bit of a different strategy for calculating the pH of that solution. All right. What's up? Why are one like this? Yeah, we'll go. We'll definitely go in there. Yep. So it's just how the pH will change with regard to this uh, titration here. And we'll talk about why all of a sudden it just kind of takes off here in a second. All right, our goal, we're gonna be calculating the pH at every single point along this curve here. Okay, so we're gonna cut this up into different regions here, because again, we're gonna have a different strategy depending on where we are in this curve. All right, so again, the first one here is that very first data point. We're gonna call that our first region. 
This is my flask with my acid in it before I've added any base at all, okay? So this is my flask with only strong acid. We have no base added. All right, so then if for this portion, for this point on my curve here, what's my strategy for calculating my pH? This is just a solution of strong acid. So we're gonna use the exact same technique that we've used up until now to calculate the pH of a solution of strong acid. All right, I'm gonna skip ahead here and we're gonna look at this point in the very middle of that vertical region here, okay? That midpoint of that vertical region, this is, we're gonna call this region three. This is our equivalence point. This is where you stop when you're doing your titration in your 1AL lab. You stop at that equivalence point, you do some calculations, right? That's what that midpoint of that vertical region is. That is the equivalence point, okay? So again, we're gonna call this region three. We'll go back to two here in a second. Region three is our equivalence point. All right, again, what it means to be the equivalence point is that moles of acid are now equal to moles of base. All right, that's the definition of the equivalence point. Okay, so for a strong acid and strong base, this is the easiest place to calculate your pH. All right, so let's take a look at why that is. Let's take an example reaction here. Ignore that because you're gonna give me the products of this reaction, all right? We're gonna take a strong acid like hydrochloric acid and a strong base like sodium hydroxide and you're going to give me the products of this acid-base reaction. So this is a skill that we really need to have down at this point, our conjugate pairs, right? Given an acid, what is its conjugate base? Given a base, what is its conjugate acid? We've played this game over and over and over again. It's a really central part to like how we do a lot of our calculations. So my acid is going to lose a proton and decrease in charge, right? That's what we would call the conjugate base and my base is going to gain a proton and increase in charge. That's what we would call the conjugate acid. All right, so what makes our life so much easier for these strong acid, strong base titrations, and spoiler alert, it's gonna be more complicated for weak acid titrations, is that the conjugate of something strong is neutral. All right, so the conjugate of a strong acid, the chloride ion, is just neutral. It doesn't affect the pH at all. Likewise, the conjugate of a strong base is neutral. Okay? So, at the equivalence point, you have added the perfect amount of base to react with all of that acid. Right? That's what it means to be at the equivalence point. So at the equivalence point,
We have no more reactant left over. Only our product, the chloride, ions, and water. All right, because we're at the equivalence point. We've added just enough base to react with all of that acid. So if I have a flask of just chloride and water, what is the pH of that solution going to be? Seven, Seven right? It's going to be neutral because every bit of acid has reacted with the base to produce neutral water and neutral chloride ions. For, so for strong acid, strong base reactions, that equivalence point is always the same value, a pH of seven. All right, so for strong acid, strong base, this is the easiest point to calculate the pH for because the pH is always seven. Okay, again, that's not gonna be the case when we start talking about weak acids and weak bases, but for this particular titration of strong and strong, pH is going to be neutral seven at that equivalence point. All right, so now let's go to this middle region right here. What's going on in this portion of our graph? We'll call this, this whole stretch here, this is region two. Okay. Notice that in this region here, I've started to add base, but my pH is still quite low, right? I am still a very acidic solution at this point. That's because I'm before my equivalence point. I haven't added enough base to react with all of that acid. So there is still acid left over in that flask in this region, right? So in region two, we have base added. but we still have an excess of our strong acid. All right, that's why we have a low pH in this region. We have some base that's been added, it's reacted with that acid, but not enough, right? So we still have some leftover strong acid in that flask. So in this region here, what we're gonna have to do is make an ice table. and our ice table will help us account for how much of that reaction has occurred and so we can figure out how much acid remains in solution. All right. And then the last region here, and so again, to be clear, when you were in the lab, you stopped at that equivalence point, right? But we're gonna keep going here. We're gonna keep on adding base past the equivalence point here. So this is now our fourth region of this graph. Okay, and notice that the pH is quite high in this region because now I'm past my equivalence point. Not only have I added enough base to react with my acid, but I've added even more, right? So now I'm just adding more and more and more base even though there's no acid left over. Okay, so in this region here, our base is added to an excess. Now we have a leftover base floating around in this flask. All of our acid's gone, it's done reacted. Right? So our pH just keeps on climbing a little bit because we're just adding more and more and more base to this flask. All right, and so then how are we going to calculate the pH in this region here? It's gonna be very similar to region two in that we're gonna have to use an ice table. All right, but now we're gonna be looking for how much base remains in our flask. All right, so we have this strong acid, strong base titration curve here, right? We start out at a very low pH with our solution of just acid. 
As we add base, it reacts with that acid, so our pH climbs. It then kind of skyrockets through this equivalence point where we've added exactly enough base to react with our acid. And then once we get past that, now we're just adding more and more and more base, an excess of base, which is why we have a very high pH that it flatlines at. All right, so now we're gonna go and we're gonna calculate the pH at each portion of this curve here. All right, so again, step one is just that solution of strong acid. How do I calculate the pH there? So we're gonna go ahead and prepare one and a half liters of 0.45 molar HCl and you're going to take a second and you're going to tell me what the pH of this solution is. So strong acids, strong bases, kind of best case scenario here because we get to use the fact that since it's a strong acid, 100% will dissociate in solution. And so the concentration of that strong acid is just equal to my hydronium ion concentration. All right, so my 0.45 molar HCl is really 0.5 molar hydronium ion. So then I can do my pH by taking the negative log of that concentration. That gives me a pH of 0 0.346, uh, that's not a six, six, seven, eight, seven, okay. And for these simple calculations here, we can even go as far as to report our answer to the correct number of sig figs. Everybody take a second and see if you can't remember what that rule is. All right, my two sig figs in my concentration correspond to two what in my pH? Decimal places. All right, so my pH of my starting solution is 0 0.035. All right, so not too bad. All right, now we're gonna actually start our titration here. We're gonna start adding in some base and we wanna calculate what the pH of that solution is. Right, so here comes the tricky bit. Now we're going to add 65 milliliters of 4.5 molar NaOH. And we want to know what the pH is now. So, like we said, now we're in region two. So we're gonna have to build a nice table. All right, we can look at our chemical equation here. HCl reacting with our hydroxide to produce chloride and water. So HCl, oh, 
actually. HCl, NaOH, chloride, and water. I don't actually care about how much product is produced, but I can go ahead and figure that out. All right. Now, one of the things that's going to make this problem, these titration problems, a little bit more tricky than what we've seen up until this point is the fact that our volume is changing. I started out with 1.5 liters of solution here. But as you add in base, that base is also in a solution, right? So I'm increasing the volume of what is in my flask, OK? I'm adding 65 mils of this basic solution. So I've changed my volume. My volume is no longer that 1.5, OK? Because of that, when we do our ice tables, we have to talk not in terms of concentration, but in terms of moles, right? Our concentration is going to change because our volume is changing. What won't change is the number of moles of acid that we have, the number of moles of base that we have, right? So what we're, when we do our, our ice table here, this is going to be a big update from the way that we've been doing it before. Our ice table has to be in moles. So we're looking for moles of HCl, moles of NaOH. Then we can figure out how many moles of product are produced here. Okay, so again, this is going to roll in some of this bit that we discussed at the very beginning of the semester about solutions. We're given a volume and a concentration, right? I'm given 1.5 liters of 0.45 molar HCl. Everybody take a second and tell me how many moles of HCl I have. Okay, so I have 1.5 liters, and I'm going to have to multiply that by my concentration, what was it, 0.45? Yep. Of 0 0.45 moles over liters, right? That's what it means to be molar. That big M is moles over liters. So if I multiply these two, my liters will cancel out and I'll be left with my correct units of moles of HCl, right? So volume times concentration gives you moles. We're gonna play that game over and over and over again in this titration chapter, all right? Uh, remember, we talked about how chemists' favorite set of units for concentration is molar, right? So we wanna be able to be comfortable with these conversions here. So 1.5 times my 0.45, get 0. 675, again, we're in moles. All right, and we're going to be lazy with our sig figs because we're doing a nice table here. OK, so now I've added 65 milliliters of 4.5 molar NaOH. Take a second and tell me what my initial number of moles of NaOH are. So if I start out with 65 milliliters, I'm not going to be able to multiply that by my concentration quite yet. I'm not in the right units. 
So I'm gonna have to use the fact that there are a thousand milliliters in one liter. Now my units are in liters, so I can turn around and multiply that by my 4.5 moles over liters. And I'm left with my number of moles of NaOH, 0.2925. Okay. Uh, how much chloride ion and water am I starting out with? Yeah, we're going to have zero to start out with. We haven't calculated how much reaction has occurred yet. Okay. Uh, if we were going to use our variables here for our change box, what should I use in my reactant side? What should the sign be? Minus, right? Reactants go down. Products go up. Okay. But we're actually going to be able to employ the same sort of uh, assumption that we used before about our strong acids and strong bases, right? So we can make a note here. We have our ice table in moles, and we're also going to use the fact that all of your strong will react. All right, so every bit of this strong that I put in there is going to react with one another. In this case, I'm going to be limited by the amount of sodium hydroxide that I put in there, right? I can't have more than 0.2925 moles of reaction occurring here because that, that's all the sodium hydroxide I have, right? So how much of this reaction is going to go down? X is going to be equal to whichever value is less here. So again, I'm limited by my number of moles of sodium hydroxide. So my X I can fill in is that negative 0.2925, okay? And that value has to be a, the same across this row here, right? I can't have more acid reacting than base because this is a one-to-one -one reaction. So if I have 0.2925 moles of base reacting, I'm going to have 0.2925 moles of acid reacting as well. Then my product side will increase by that same amount. So at the end here, once this thing reaches equilibrium, I don't have any of my base left over, right? It's all reacted. And my amount of acid is going to be the sum of those two boxes. So 6.75 minus the 0 0.2925, 0 0.3825. All right, and let's be good here. What are our units on that 0 0.3825? What are we talking about in this table here? Moles of, in this case, HCl. All right, and then I've created 0.2925 moles of sodium chloride, or yeah, sodium chloride and 0.2925 moles of water. But again, these are neutral. So I don't really care, right? Great, fantastic, we can calculate it. Is it gonna influence our pH? No. All right, so the last step here is to calculate the uh, pH of this solution. And let's just look at our formula. Our pH equals the negative log of the concentration of hydronium ions. Do I have the concentration of hydronium ions here? Now, I have an important component of it. I have how many moles of strong acid I have, so I know how many moles of uh, hydronium I have, but I don't have my concentration yet, right? So remember, for concentration, we need moles of H3O plus divided by liters of solution, okay? 
So given this problem here, take a second and see if you can't see where I'm going here. Finish this off for me. Get the pH of this solution. Yeah, so when we do our change table, and we're going to be using one-to-one -one for our acid-base reactions, but we will sort of graduate to more complicated reactions later in the chapter. And absolutely, that skill that we learned with building our ice tables where that coefficient has to go in there as well, you would absolutely put that in there. We're going to be using one-to-one -one for our acid-base reactions. All right, but yes, we will we'll sort of see some more of that later. So, again, before I can do my pH, I need my concentration of my hydronium ions. From my ice table, I have the moles of hydronium ions, right? I mean, to be clear, I calculated moles of HCl, but as we've played that game over and over again, HCls will completely dissociate into these hydronium ions. All right, but now I need to divide that by the total volume that is now in that flask, right? And let's remind ourselves, we started out with 1.5 liters in the flask, but the whole shtick is we had to pay attention to moles because we changed that volume when we add base. So now my new volume is going to be that one and a half liters plus the 65 mils of solution that I've added, my 65 mils of titrant that I've added to that flask. Okay, so my volume of my new solution is going to be my 1.5 plus my 0 0.065. I just converted my milliliters to liters. All right, this is now my liters of solution that I have. Cool, so then I punch that into my calculator. I get my new concentration is 0.244408, right? We're talking about a concentration, so I'll put that big M molar on there. And then to finish this off and get the pH, I'm gonna take the negative log of that concentration Punch that into my calculator, 0.61, well, we can leave it at that. Okay, so now we've added a volume, 65 mils of our base. Okay, we had to create an ice table, but a big change here is that we gotta keep track of moles, not concentration, because our volume's actually changing in this experiment. Okay, once we get through our ice table, we have moles of, our, of strong acid, which is moles of hydronium. We just have to then calculate the concentration by uh, dividing it by our new volume here Right, our original volume plus whatever volume of sodium hydroxide of strong base that was added. Then we take the negative log, we get our pH. Okay, let's note that our pH started out at 0.35 and it increased to 0.61. That makes sense because I'm adding base. 
but it's still quite low because what I've been left over with is just a flask of strong acid. All right? I've added base in there, it's reacted, but I still got a bunch of leftover strong acid in there. Okay? And this calculation would work for any point along this region, right? I would just change that volume of base that's added, that 65. We could also calculate it after 125 milliliters, after 150 milliliters, right? We would just change that volume of the base that's added. That's still that same strategy that we would employ. Okay? All right, so now we're going to move on to our third region here. Stick with our 4.5 molar. Okay, so now I've added enough sodium hydroxide that my solution has turned that light pink color, and I'm going to go ahead and stop, all right, because that's my equivalence point. What is the pH at that equivalence point? All right, for a strong acid and a strong base, this is probably the easiest question that I could ask you. You don't even have to do any math. The pH is always going to be 7 at that equivalence point. All right, now, that's all well and good, but it's not gonna be that easy, okay? What I could also ask you about this equivalence point here is, all right, great, how much base did you add? How much base was required to get to that equivalence point? All right, so, how much of that 4.5 molar NaOH was added to reach the equivalence point. All right, so remember, what does it mean to be at your equivalence point? It means that the moles of acid, and to be clear, the moles of acid that you started with initially, right? So we can even say moles of acid initial equals moles of base that have been added. All right, if we look back at our ice table here, how many moles of acid did we have in that flask initially? We calculated that, right? That was our first calculation up here, that 0.675. So we have 0.675 moles of acid initially. So how many moles of base do we have at the equivalence point? 0.675, right? It's got to be that same value. That's the definition of the equivalence point. So this is how many moles of NaOH were added. We have our concentration of our NaOH here. So you're going to take a second and tell me the volume. I can say how much, I mean what volume. of that NaOH was added.
Now I'm going to have to divide by that concentration so that my units cancel out, right? I'm going to set everything up and be good about my units. I'm going to have to divide by that 4.5 molar because that will put moles on the bottom. So I get a concentration of 0.15 liters, 150 milliliters, right? That's how much base would have to be added to reach that equivalence point. All right, so at the equivalence point, if I ask you for the pH, that's the easiest problem. It's seven, right? For a strong acid, strong base titration, it's always going to be seven at the equivalence point. What's sort of more hard that I could ask you, because you'd have to rely on what it means to be the equivalence point, as well as some simple solution stoichiometry, would be what volume of base was added. All right, so now we're going to go past that equivalence point. I know that at 0.15 liters, I'm at my equivalence point. So now we're going to add 0.2 liters of 4.5 molar NaOH. What is the pH? Okay, now we're in what we called region four, where we said we were going to have to build an ice table. But just like before, we're gonna do the, basically the exact same thing that we did in region two, where we're gonna build our ice table in moles. The only difference from region two is now we're gonna have an excess of sodium hydroxide. Right? We're going to have added more sodium hydroxide than we have. So everybody take a second and see if you can't fill in your ice table for this particular portion of the problem. Try to be lazy and concentrate. All So my moles of acid that I initially had, that's the same as it's always been, right? I haven't added more acid at any point. But now I'm going to add a full 0.2 liters of that 4.5 molar NaOH. So now I've added a total of 0.9 moles of NaOH. Okay. So we said that reactants go down and products go up. What will the value of X be in, this, in these boxes here? Awesome, right? So I have 0.9 moles of base, but I can't have 0.9 moles of my acid react because I don't have enough, right? So now I'm limited by the amount of acid that's in this flask. So all I can have react is that 0.675. So my value for X here is that 0.675. Okay. 
Okay, so now, now that I'm past my equivalence point, I have zero acid in my flask. All of it's been reacted, right? Because now I'm past that equivalence point. And what I'm left over with is an excess of that sodium hydroxide, of that strong base. In fact, I got 0.225 moles of that sodium hydroxide left over here. Okay, we got 0 0.675 moles of sodium chloride and water. That's all well and good, but again, we don't really care because these are neutral. So now I just have to figure out what my concentration of sodium hydroxide is. I know I have 0.225 moles. Right, but what's the volume of that solution now? So now I have my 1.5 liters that I initially started out with in that flask. And now I have added a full 0.2 liters of base. All right, so I got 1.7 liters now total in that flask for a final concentration of 0.1323 molar sodium hydroxide. The 1.5, that was how much I initially had at the very beginning of my titration, right? That's the volume of solution that I started out with in the flask, and then I've been adding base to it. So we could have made our lives more complicated by accounting for the fact that this point two, I already calculated part. You can scratch it and go all the way from the beginning. Let's say that now I've added, at the end, I've added a total of 0.2 liters of base, right? So to be clear, this was asking how, what the pH was after 0.2 liters of base was added, not in addition to the 65 mils that we added before, right? This is now just past our equivalence point. Okay? And I trust that now that we have a concentration of hydroxide, everybody knows how to get from P to pH from here, right? Because we did that a whole bunch. Cool. All right. So we'll pick this up next time, making it more complicated by talking about weak acids. <laughs>